moment, welcoming our co-hosts, New York Times best-selling author, The Silent Assassin, which I like almost as good as The Social Assassin now, John Gilstrap. <laughs> Johnny, good morning to you. Good morning. The villagers are nervous this morning. There's a strange yellow orb in the sky. Not sure what to do with it. With the sun, the moon this morning was really impressive. I don't know if you saw the crescent moon. It was, if you're up early enough to see that. I am, of course. Yes, I, <laughs> I, yeah. I and I alone <laughs> am awake. You see, it was really. It was, you see the vampires going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> They're passing me on the way in. It was uh, very yellow and uh, very low in the sky. It was uh, awesome to see. Also, uh, Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey is with us this morning too. Matthew. Good morning. Good to be here. As always. As always. Always always good to be here. Well dressed. Good uh, good oh. job, sir. Well, we're on TV. Yeah, we Rob. are, man. Yeah. Well, are you in uh, court today at any point along the way? No, but I do have other meetings, but no court. But I want to. We're on TV. I want to I appreciate have that. a suit and tie on. It's a good attitude. Because you're introducing me as prosecutor, so I, I owe it to, to respect that office to put on a uh, a jacket and tie, just like I would going to church. And he stopped calling you Natalie. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome, Natalie. <laughs> that was Natalie Clatt. Different Natalie. Uh, we have uh, as our first guest, Matt, somebody that uh, you uh, would be very familiar with as the person in charge of the West Virginia First Foundation. Yes, yes, Jonathan Board. He was named our the, by the Attorney General, was named the new Executive Director, the, and, and the first executive director of the West Virginia First Foundation. So it's been it's been a, a few months in the making. We've all been on pins and needles waiting mm-hmm. on this appointment, and it's here now. And it, there's no question in my mind that he is the right person at the right time to lead this organization. Well, let's bring him on. Jonathan Board, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Well, good morning, friends. It's good to be with you. Great to have you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Jonathan? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a lifelong resident of West Virginia, I think fourth or fifth generation. Uh, Very proud of that. Um, And there's so many good things uh, that I've experienced here in the state and uh, privileged to work alongside some amazing folks to try and solve some of those those greater challenges uh, that we now experience. Um, I was raised in the uh, the north central area, and but for a few occasions uh, called West Virginia home my entire life. Okay. Uh, you are an attorney, correct? Well, not exactly. Uh, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, graduated law school in '09 and had an opportunity to go and work in, in D.C. and worked on health policy for many years. Uh, one of my, my first jobs, uh, actually at a fellowship uh, in the state of West Virginia with the Attorney General's Office during law school, uh, was working on the Purdue Pharma case and, and its progeny. And I learned a lot about uh, the challenges then, uh, and here we are baked into uh, the uh, settlements here with the opioid fund with the West Virginia First Foundation is some of that from Purdue Pharma. So we've we've gone full circle. Uh, It's been an interesting journey. So you have a law degree, but you do not practice law. Is that what you're saying? I think we have enough lawyers in the state of West Virginia at this point. Uh, no, no offense to uh, my chairman, uh, who is, uh, and, and if I may, I would like to thank uh, Matt uh, Harvey for uh, serving as, as sort of de facto uh, chairman uh, or exec- executive director of the West Virginia First Foundation for, for several months. Uh, yeoman's work, and uh, sometimes that can be thankless. So on behalf of, of all of us, and certainly the state of West Virginia, I want to thank him. He's a pretty humble guy, but uh, did really good work and, and set us up for success. Well, you would be the second person I know with a Juris Doctorate who did not or does not currently practice law with that. The, there was a news director here, Richard Strader, who had his JD but never took the bar exam, instead went to work for the Voice of America uh, and uh, as a news director for a couple of different places, including this place. So uh, that's pretty cool. Matt Harvey, you've just been cited by Mr. Board, and uh, you do practice law. So go ahead I do, and take yes. the next question here. Hey, good morning, John. Thanks for being good on morning, with sir. us today. Um, My pleasure. So you also – talk about your experience in the SUD uh, area. Yeah. Yeah, so um, worked in healthcare uh, much of my professional life. Uh, and again, learning very early on, West Virginia is, is unique in its approach. Um, the one good thing that, that we have in West Virginia is that we're all neighbors. This is a very, very small state. 
Uh, and uh, losing friends and family members, you learn really quickly that, that we need special help. So I got to work with uh, SAMHSA and bring them in uh, or very early on. It was the first time that agency had been to uh, any district. Uh, we brought them here to West Virginia with Congressman McKinley, uh, worked through a lot of our, our peer review folks uh, there, both uh, in, in North Central and, and in Southern West Virginia, uh, worked in recovery programs uh, in Taylor County. Uh, we had uh, some really special success there. Um, and then stood up uh, what most people know as Hazel's House of Hope. Uh, it was the idea is, and I think this is something that, you know, it's a little bit of macro micro, but I think it's something that can be uh, broadened and, and pushed out throughout the state, which is uh, in the nonprofit space, we often have a lot of folks competing for the same dollar um, and, and sometimes some overlap. And so what we did at Hazel's House of Hope was uh, some good folks uh, basically purchased a campus, uh, what was a former large hotel, and brought together a lot of different social services uh, and put them under one roof. Uh, and so it allowed experts to be experts. You had a feeding program, you had a housing program, you had recovery programs, uh, you had you had gap services, uh, all coming around. And you know we like these buzzwords and, and wraparound services. Well, we we're actually doing it now. And and I think that's what's uh, well. I think there's a great opportunity to to do these types of things. And I think that's kind of the core of West Virginia First. Uh, we we obviously have to do things differently. Uh, than we've done in the past. And there's so many amazing people who are working so hard. Um, and this is this is very much holistic. It can't be one thing. And that's that my experience has been really broad because you've got to work in behavioral health. You've got to work in, in the foster program. Uh, and, of course, uh, expanding access to health care uh, throughout the state. Uh, so I, I served as a vice president with Mon Health System uh, and worked on strategic initiatives, uh, went through the uh, – partnership there to create Vandalia Health, and, and now we're on Health, CAMC, and Davis Health Systems, uh, and just really pushing this needle forward. Uh, we have to expand access, and that's that's what the West Virginia First Foundation is going to do. John Gilstrap. How many millions are in the West Virginia First Foundation right now? In the account? In the account. $220 million. Okay, so... Ish. $220 million. You're the new executive director. You have to feel a little bit like the dog that just caught the car. Um, how do you prioritize? What's your first step? Yeah, it, it, you know, it is. it can seem overwhelming, and not so much the money. Let's be honest. We've, we've got a lot of counties and a lot of different needs throughout those counties. Uh, that money, if we just wanted to give everybody 100 bucks. You could walk away and say, well, we did our, we did our best. And, and, and that, of course, is nonsense. And we've done that in the past. I mean, let's admit it. There have been challenges in this state where we have um, sort of just haphazardly thrown money about and not meaningfully uh, changed the, the direction of the state. And so I think we've got to be really focused. We, we've got to do – and I, I think the first thing that we have to do is, is conduct a proper needs assessment throughout the state that is broad – uh, I suppose, in its approach, uh, but also really narrow. I've had the privilege of traveling all over the state uh, in the last uh, few months, and it's been very clear to me that even neighboring counties, forget counties, neighboring towns, have very different um, access to service and very different needs. And to the credit of people working in these in these cities, they've gotten very creative in how they solve the same problem, right? We're all fighting the same fight, but we have different tools, and so I think we need to go in and look with uh, a, a great deal of, uh, hmm, I don't know, I hate synergy, but, you know, there, there are opportunities here to uh, unify services and then expand those services. And where there are gaps, let's try and fill those gaps. Uh, things that we know work really well, let's, let's support that and, and help our, our friends and, and neighbors who are boots on the ground uh, struggling every day trying to save lives. Uh, we've got to we've got to make a, a real impact here. And, and let me just add on to that, if, if I may, John, j as a reminder, uh, number one, the foundation was created by the counties and municipalities. And and in that court process, they they established they have executed an MOU that sets a lot of the guidelines and and guardrails for the foundation. Um, and the, one of those is the foundation is going to rely heavily on expert panels. 
So that's our that's going to be the eyes and ears in the local regions that have our, our, our boots on the ground that see the problem and know what the local problems are. And that's going to be from all across the state as well. And is there a coordinated effort to um, co- well, to coordinate the the money that went the percentage of the mo- the overall money that went to the local jurisdictions? Is is that part of what the foundation is considering in terms of its strategy, or is that sort of set aside and the the foundation considers only that which is the foundation's money? Well, I can tell you in the. Uh in the MOU, it does require the only there's no the foundation doesn't have oversight over the county. So let's be right. clear about that and and how they spend their money. But it does there is a reporting qu- requirement on the counties and the municipalities that receive funds that they report those results back to the foundation. And the idea behind that is that the foundation will then be able to uh, it will be a, as a, a way of collecting the information to see what's working, what's not working in areas, and to prevent redundant resources expended. And then I'll let Mr. our guest talk. Jonathan, Jonathan <laughs> yeah. Board, who's the yeah. executive director of the West Virginia First Foundation, is our guest via telephone there. There was this, uh, Mike Stewart was on yesterday and made mention of the fact that some of these funds were being spent on jail costs, Matt and Jonathan. The foundation is not spending money on jail bills. I, what he's referring to, I believe, and, and I, I don't think this was any intentional misrepresentation by him. I'm not saying that. It just when you're interviewing, you, there, sometimes the issues can get conflated. Counties have the ability to to use this settlement funds to to pay some of their past due jail bills if they want. Remember, when when the money comes out, 24.5% goes straight to the counties and municipalities, and then the counties and municipalities have, have set up a foundation for the other 72.5%, and then 3% goes to the Attorney General's office for expenses. So if they have a need locally, and if the county commissions in these counties determine that, they, that that's a need that they have to address, then they can spend that money on, somewhat on so, catching so up on bills. So some of it is indeed being spent on jail bills, but not I, the money you know. control. Not Right. I, I'm unaware of any county that has. I'm not saying they haven't. I just haven't heard. I haven't haven't checked in with all but, 55 counties. But in theory, counties. it could happen, just not the money Absolutely. you control. Absolutely. The in county does what the county does with the county's right. money. Right. Now, they'll have to report that, and they have the ability, I believe, to take 50% of, of the money that they've received to use to catch up on past expenses. Mm-hmm. Because for... 25 years plus they've had to spend money against this scourge and now it's a it's a way to kind of help spend money on things that they've neglected and a lot of it is is reflected in an increased jail costs because of the imprisonment absolutely of, of, absolutely of, of, of absolutely users. and again that's that's a local decision that they yeah. have to make jonathan could could you take uh, a, a sizable chunk of this money and build another drug rehab center in west virginia with it would that be within the bounds of the restrictions for the money well, I, you know, I applaud the attorney general and, and the governor's office and the legislature who, who worked through this and the counties who served um, in this process as well. And, and you know, it's it's a very unique uh, situation where you have a, a, a foundation that was created publicly, uh, that it was stood up privately and given the ability to uh, be very creative in its approach. Uh, to answer your question, I, I, I suppose that would that would be an option. Uh, I, I think we're going to lean very heavily on the wisdom of those expert panels uh, who are local, and, and they can advise us. I, I think it would be a little be a little obtuse for, for, for any one of us to say, hey, here's the one thing that you have to do. Because what we've learned uh, in, in years and years in this space is that there isn't one solution. And what may work in one county uh, may not work so well in another. And so, uh, you know, obviously, uh, all options are on the table, uh, but I think I would be very hesitant to move forward with with one singular big shot, uh, because I don't think it's I don't think that's going to be the solution. Certainly wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I'm all ears, as as is the board. And and I'll let the board speak for for itself. But um, I'm I'm excited to see what those local solutions are that are brought up to us. In, I'm not saying no to anything, but but certainly open to all all options. One of the ways, of course, 
to thin the number of drug users is to prevent drug users. And I remember in the 80s, we had the Nancy Reagan Just Say No campaign. Uh, a lot of folks made fun of that campaign. But the fact of the matter is, if you do say no when someone's offering you drugs, that's 100 percent effective. Uh, it's not always uh, that scenario that pops up, however. There's a lot of different uh, reasons why people become addicted uh, to drugs. But will you be, as a, a organization, looking to do some preventative medicine, so to speak, in regards to future drug use? Well, so to be sure, we're not going to run anything directly. We're looking forward to partnering with people who uh, work throughout the continuum of care. And, and I think you've hit something really important. You, you think about the continuum of care. The front end of that is prevention right? Early identification. Then you go to treatment, recovery, and, and, and reentry, and all the other things behind. But I think a lot of times our focus can be so isolated and so narrow on, on sort of the back end, the waterfall. Uh, we forget that there are a lot of streams that feed into that river. And that the front end of that uh, is, is the tributaries of prevention. And I, and I think there, there is where we can actually generationally change this problem. Look, we have to grow the corpus. This this foundation, and, and I give a lot of credit to, to our chairman, Harvey, there, and, and many others, uh, we understand that this foundation must exist for uh, our children, grandchildren, and, and, frankly, generations and people we will never meet, but we have a duty and responsibility to protect. The the drug trade and, and, and the use of illicit and illicit drugs and even uh, overdose, or excuse me, o- over prescription and, and of course leads to overdose that's going to exist forever right so we have to we have to spend some time of course we want to continue to protect recovery reentry, all of that treatment by all means but we need to do some substantial things on the front end of this and prevention is going to be key uh just say no uh this, this is your brain on crack you remember all those old oh, yeah. commercials and dare um all really valuable stuff and uh, I think we need to, to be um, mindful in, in, in reinitiating some of these things. Any program that's this big is going to be, come, no matter what decision is made, it's going to be criticized by somebody. It's not going to be the preference of someone. So how insulated is the foundation from political pressures, political whims and wins uh, as, as time goes on? Yeah, you know, th- that came up. I mean, let's be honest, in my own circumstance, I had uh, announced I was running for state Senate, uh, and legally we went through ethics and we looked at that, and legally I could have remained in that race. It's going to be a competitive race. Uh, but ethically and, frankly, morally, uh, it became very clear to me uh, if we're going to establish this as, as non-connected to any political party, uh, or, or politics in general, uh, we'd have to remove that. Uh, it, it's very hard in a state that's, uh, you know, our population, I think, is less than that of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's, it's challenging to not have some political element. I think you're 100% right. How do we, how do we distance ourselves? The, the only way to do that is, is the absolute best we can. And, and where there's opportunity to uh, make this very focused on the people of West Virginia rather than any um, agenda or ideology, I, I think we have to. And as difficult a decision as that was, uh, on, on some level, it was actually quite easy because this is so much more important than than basically anything else we'll do. This is listen. This is the calling of our generation. I, I think anybody who thinks other is uh, is not well informed. So the foundation itself is completely self-contained. It does not report to a larger entity. It is its own. It's its own reporting chain. Well, no, there are there are levels of of observance and reporting, but not direct. I know that we have uh, we will be uh, chatting certainly with uh, I believe a specific committee, if not the legislature broadly, um, on an annual basis. We have some uh, oversight from other folks as well as as would any um, foundation. But we are a private foundation as well. So just as you would see with, say, Benedum or anyone else, um, it, it has some autonomy. But there is a, there's a level of uniqueness here, um, and there's, there's a gravity to this, right? Every, every dollar that we have, every penny that we have, uh, is because someone uh, went through a very challenging time. Or uh, in, in 
unfortunately, in many cases, uh, people passed away. And so we are the voice of those folks. So um, granted, we're not a government agency, and I think that was a smart move. Uh, we certainly still do have um, not only the, the traditional trappings uh, and, and reporting that is required, uh, but we'll also, uh, I think, have the, the gravity of the moment and, and the fact that um, we're here because folks have suffered. Just, and just to make a few other points there, John, so so in the tobacco settlements, it's been reported that 3% went to cessation programs because the county co- commissions and the mayors across the state had this great foresight. They have put 72.5% of the settlement into this foundation with guardrails that will be spent on pre- prevention enforcement treatment ensuring that at least 72.5% will go towards combating and abating the problem and mitigation. And, and, then whatever, and then plus whatever they spend towards those efforts as well. So this is innovative. This money is going to not just be spent in filling potholes. Uh, it's a tremendous opportunity. I'll also point out $200 million has to serve the whole state right now. And there will be other monies from the lawsuit coming in. Tr- trickling in through through the next 15 years but right now the corpus is 200 million 220 million dollars uh put, to put that in perspective Kanawha county's county budget for the year is about 100 million and the city of charleston is around 100 million dollars so we what they spend in one year is a is what we have a little more of that to spend across the whole state so it, it's it has to be the decisions that are going to be made by the experts, by Jonathan, by myself, and the other board members, we have to be surgical with this with these dollars. As you as you look at programs and such, how much exposure does the board have to people who were affected by the opioid crisis directly, either because they were uh, addicts themselves or they lost a family member who went uh, through this uh, opioid crisis and didn't make it out the other end? Are you asking me or, or both John? of you? Yeah, both of you. So that you're always in touch with the people who are affected by this. Are there those who will have a voice on this board or will have regular input with you? A- absolutely. Lived experience is, I mean, if we, that's, we have people on the board that have lived experience and people that are going to present to the regional panels and we're, are going to be soliciting funds from the foundation. Many of those have lived experience so there is absolutely an avenue and a way for someone with lived experience to have input into this foundation jonathan yeah i well look we have doctors on the board we have uh, folks running uh, drug court uh, and i i think i'll speak for myself personally uh if first of all if you live in the state of west virginia and and you don't know someone who has been affected by this that well you're blessed uh, I know my family has uh, lost a cousin to this, uh, worked certainly in the healthcare space and, and seen that for, for many, many decades now. Um, but, you know, look, CDC tells us uh, in the state of West Virginia, one in four children, uh, that is uh, those under the age of 18, will not just bump into or, or casually observe uh, the, the great challenges of opioid, but be directly affected by it. Um, as a dad of four, uh, that that speaks volumes to me. You know, we are fighting for this state, uh, and we have to heal this state from the inside out. Uh, so it, to, I, I will answer your question directly. I, I would say between the, the board, uh, the executive director, and, and support, uh, I don't think there's someone here who hasn't been touched uh, directly or indirectly by uh, this crisis. Jonathan, thanks so much for your time on the program today. We greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you all. You you enjoy the sun. We're, we're in the middle of snow out here. Oh, my goodness. No, thank you. <laughs> we'll keep the sun. <laughs> Jonathan Board, the new executive director of the West Virginia First Foundation. Thanks to Matt Harvey for setting that interview up for us.